Very so Manolis, Manolis um, 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 Douglas Krat, uh, who is a third year graduate student working with me is going to introduce you um, briefly. And uh, after that um, uh, will be your seminar. I will be moderating the questions. So uh, I ask anyone faculty and students who have questions to write in the chat. And after the seminar, I will invite first students and then faculty to ask those questions. Um, and uh, you will have a meeting with the graduate students for 45 minutes running from uh, 12.45 to 1.15 in this same Zoom meeting uh, link. And uh, I will join after the students and Dr. Garth Ehrlich will join after me. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to also yes. very briefly introduce uh, Erwin Youngreis, who's uh, on the meeting with us as well. Erwin, can you say a quick hi? So he, uh, he's the one who's been leading all of the SARS-CoV-2 work in our lab. So, uh, you know, he's uh, the person responsible for all of this, but his voice is actually not working today. So he, he will have to wave to answer questions, yes or no, I guess. Awesome. So Douglas, um, you are very welcome to start. Perfect. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to the seminar. Um, I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Manolis Kellis. Um, he's coming to us from MIT, where he's currently a distinguished professor in the electrical engineering and computer science department. Uh, Dr. Kellis received his master's in engineering in the field of artificial intelligence, um, and then his PhD in computational biology, both at MIT. Um, during his PhD, he worked under Dr. Eric Lander, um, who's the founding director of the Broad Institute. Uh, developing methods of comparative genomics to identify genes and regulatory elements in yeast. He continued this work through his postdoc at the Broad Institute, helping to publish a half dozen nature publications on computational methods of comparative genomics and epigenetics uh, from yeast to mammals. Uh, since joining MIT as a professor, Dr. Kellis has received a number of awards and honors, including the NSF's Career Award, the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, as well as being named one of the top 35 innovators under the age of 35 by Tech Review Magazine. Uh, his lab currently focuses on developing algorithmic, uh, statistical, and machine learning methods to interpret the functional elements encoded in the human genome um, to ultimately reconstruct the regulatory circuits they define uh, and understand their evolutionary mechanisms. During the current pandemic, he's used this background in comparative genomics to help further our understanding of the SARS-CoV-2 genome um, and has uh, already presented a fantastic talk uh, at the Cold Spring Harbor COVID-19 Rapid Research Reports meeting um, on this work. Um, so without further introduction, uh, I'm excited to hear how this story has progressed. So I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here and it's a really a pleasure to, to present. And I'm so excited to sort of hear your feedback on our work and uh, you know form potential uh, collaborations and interactions. So I'm going to give two seminars today. The first is going to be focused on SARS-CoV-2 and then the second one is going to give you a broader perspective on our work that's actually touching on many different aspects of uh, the role of immune cells in the brain, in metabolism, and of course in immune disorders. So the first part is going to be about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the work of uh, Erwin uh, Youngreis and uh, Rachel Silfen, uh, and uh, in, in, you know, in collaboration with uh, you know, a former member of our lab. So our goal was basically re, uh, use some of our comparative genomics techniques to try to revisit the gene content of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and also to understand the mutational impact of recent mutations in the COVID-19 pandemic using a larger evolutionary context. So, uh, <laughs> For us genomicists, this is what SARS-CoV-2 actually looks like. This is basically 29,903 nucleotides of trouble. And within this um, uh, you know, genome uh, are encoded a large number of contiguous open reading frames, uh, one giant one, uh, which basically encodes up to 16 different polypeptides, uh, which actually also includes a frame shift in the middle of it. So right there, there's a slippery sequence that basically causes the ribosome to now switch translation reading frames from there to here. And uh, of course, the spike protein that everybody has been reading about all over the news and a bunch of other uh, both named and unnamed proteins. So the big question is, uh, you know, which ones are uh, actually genuine proteins? And, you wouldn't think that that's even a question for a genome that fits in one page. 
but uh, we found uh, studying this that it's surprisingly uh, not uh, finalized. So these proteins play a huge number of diverse functions that you guys uh, actually know and understand better than most people in the world. Um, I'm going to uh, point out just a handful of them. So Pol2, of course, uh, you know, polymerase for making the copies. Uh, M for, you know, the membrane, the outer coat of the virus. You basically have a uh, nucleocapsid, which packages and protects the RNA genome. And it's a roll spiral, a long spiral that's wrapping the cloning RNA. And uh, there's, you know, ORF8, for example, which has no known function. ORF6, which also has uh, no known function. And then there's um, ORF10, which uh, is shown here in gray, which we actually believe is not, not a protein. And then uh, the envelope protein E, and of course the spike protein, which includes spike S1, which is the initial attachment, which is very rapidly evolving, and spike S2, which is the uh, sort of entry part, which is actually quite slowly evolving. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 basically tricks our genome into making uh, this large number of proteins out of a single mRNA. And uh, the way that it does that is this contiguous translation of ORF1A, contiguous translation of ORF1AB based on this slippage, and then uh, a subsequent reinitiation of translation in the middle of this uh, of the genome, which is traditionally not possible because human ribosomes don't like to reinitiate in the middle, but the genome basically has these uh, subgenomic RNAs that are thought to be initially translated from the plus strand to the minus, tra sorry, reverse transcribed, uh, yeah, reverse transcribed from the plus strand to the minus strand, and then followed by transcription from the RNA-mediated transcription from the, you know, minus strand back to the plus strand. Thanks to these uh, translation regulatory sequences, which are sort of um, looping back to this TRSL from this TRSB, multiple copies. And you can actually see those uh, in the genome. You can basically see that in between these ORFs, these tiny, tiny little number of black amino acids, like ACG, AACTT, is also found here, uh, and is also found there, and is also found here, ACG, AAC, and so on and so forth. So basically, these spacers are in fact allowing the genome to sort of reinitiate new transcripts uh, across all of these spaces. So that basically allows uh, the ribosome to bind here and then initiate each of those uh, serial. So uh, the annotation of the genome uh, surprisingly varies dramatically between uh, these, um, you know, even, even though there's just such a small number of genes. I mean, Erwin's primary work is understanding the human genome and annotating human genes, of which there are, you know, 20,000, and the number of exons in the, is in the hundreds of thousands, which basically means that there's plenty of room for error, and yet we've been sort of plowing at it for many years now. For a genome this small, we did not think that there was much left for our methods to do. So what do our methods do? Our methods basically look at the phylogeny of closely related species. So what we've, the way that we've been you know, annotating human genes is by uh, aligning large numbers of mammals. So, you know, these are uh, diverged since the mammalian radiation about 60 million years ago when the dinosaurs gave room to these uh, tiny little creatures to sort of, you know, conquer the rest of the planet. And uh, the, you know, these 60 million years of evolution have basically given us a large number of mutations that we can use to study the patterns of evolution. And that's the key insight, the fact that we are studying not the conservation level of a region. We are studying specifically the mutations in this region to see not how fast it's evolving, but the pattern in which it's evolving. And the reason for that is that protein coding regions evolve in very specific ways that are very distinct from the ways that non-coding regions evolve. So in this alignment of multiple mammals, you see that if I color every triplet substitution based on whether it is synonymous, conservative, or amino acid changing slash radical, you basically see that within protein coding regions, you have all of these synonymous and conservative substitutions, 
Whereas as soon as the stop, a stop codon happens, there's a very sharp transition into a different evolutionary regime of radical amino acid changes, which are basically, uh, you know, which would pre perturb the protein sequence if this was a protein coding region and perturb the protein function, but in a non-coding region are perfectly tolerated. So that's one source of signal, basically synonymous conservative versus radical. The other source of signal is, of course, absence of stop codon insertions in these three colors, where you see plenty of stop codon insertions you know, outside protein coding regions. And also, all of the insertions and deletions are multiples of three within protein coding regions to preserve the reading frame of translation, whereas outside, they are uh, uh, you know, very often frame shifting, which you can see here in orange. So putting all these together, we can construct a single signal that basically tells us not whether something is highly conserved at the nucleotide level, but whether something is specifically evolving in a pattern consistent with protein coding function. And notice that protein coding function is not white. White is perfectly conserved. Protein coding regions are in fact specifically green because they do change. Protein coding regions don't go unchanged. And the reason for that is that Evolution happens, mutations happen. And if there's no selection to preserve the primary sequence of the nucleotides, then that sequence will change as amino acids that are equally well suited are substituted for the initial amino acids. And also as codons that code for the same amino acid are substituted for the original codon. So putting these two, these sort of set of signatures together, we can now get a single signal that tells us whether something's coding or non-coding across the entire genome. And that's what we're now going to use in the SARS-CoV-2 genome using a large number of closely related species. The other thing that comparative genomics allows us to do is basically go to the set of mutations that have occurred in the current pandemic. And you've all heard, for example, about the D614G mutation, the spike protein, which has been associated with increased transmission in multiple independent CDs, in multiple independent events. Um, uh, you, it has risen in frequency. And uh, you know a bunch of other mutations, for example, these four are co-inherited with the D614G. The question is, which ones are functional? Which ones are actually driving the selective pressures? And what does evolution have to say to help interpret which ones are more likely to actually be benign or functional. So to apply these methods, basically Erwin selected a set of 44 Sarbecoviruses genomes. So SARS related beta corona viruses. So it's a, it's a you know, condensation of these words. So these are the SARS related beta coronavirus uh, genomes. And you can see here in stars, all of the human pathogens in coronavirus. This, this this and that are basically the common cold. This one is MERS, so Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And then um, these two here as well uh, are basically SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So basically this is the SARS-2003 and then this is uh, COVID-19. So the first thing you'll notice is just how enormous these evolutionary distances are. So basically, if you take these 44 cervicovirus genomes, you have the same amount of evolution as the entire mammalian tree that we have previously studied. So it's the mammalian equivalent of 60 million years of divergence within these super closely related strains of uh, beta, uh, sorry, related beta coronaviruses. If you look at, you know, even this genome here, it's, you know, you don't even see alignment in uh, ORF6 and ORF8. You know, this is just way too far to even, you know, construct this genome-wide alignment. Whereas, uh, you know, within this uh, tree, you actually see all of the regions quite nicely conserved. So the, um, uh, and, and now applying these methods that I showed you earlier, we can now start asking for each of the reading frames. And the reason for that is that these methods are absolutely reading frame specific. If I shift the entire alignment by one nucleotide, these scores are going to be completely different. If I shift it by two nucleotides, they're going to be completely different. If I shift it by three nucleotides, they're going to be the same again, uh, you know, because the codons are, you know, sort of completely um, translated in a and evolving in a completely different way 
you could shift the reading frame. So therefore, we have three scores, one for reading frame one, one for reading frame two, and one for reading frame two, three. And as you scan across the genome, you can see these remarkably high conservation in reading frame two. And then just at the end of ORF1A, you basically have this frame shift side where uh, conservation basically switches to the first reading frame. And then right after that, you basically have, you know, these few nucleotides that I showed you earlier, and then you're switching reading frame again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So basically what you see is this very strong signal for this method that Erwin has both uh, helped develop and extend. So Philo CSF, which stands for codon substitution frequencies. So this Philo CSF signal that we see here is extremely strong and extremely re, um, reading frame specific. So the second thing you notice is that, for example, uh, the S1 protein has almost no conservation at the nucleotide level. If you look at FASCOS or Philo P, it actually has negative conservation. It appears that this region is just not functional if you just look at nucleotide evolution. But if you look at protein coding constraint, you see that even though it's super fast evolving, it's extremely conserved at the amino acid level. So that basically tells us that that's a super fast evolving protein rather than a fully unconstrained non-coding region. So you can use that to now go and look at each of these NSP proteins, for example, within ORF1AB. And you can see these you know, beautiful conservation and these pockets of rapid change associated with specific domains of NSP3 um, and you know, uh, overall just a very clean signal. If you look at the last third of the genome, which encodes you know, everything uh, past this ORF1AB, you basically see this um, you know, uh, S1 that I mentioned earlier, and then uh, which is ORF2, and then ORF3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, as you see here. So what do we find? We find that there's basically, um, you know, very strong protein coding constraint in nearly all of the proteins. And specifically, if you look at ORF8, you see that at the nucleotide level, it has no conservation, but at the protein level, it has two pockets of very clean phylo CFCF signal, indicating that indeed it is constrained at the protein coding level. If you look at ORF10, you see that it has outstanding nucleotide uh, conservation, but at the protein level, it has zip, like basically no protein coding constraint, suggesting that ORF10 is not an ORF at all. It's not a functional protein coding gene. It happens to have no stop codons, but the constraint appears to be at some other level. And our interpretation is that it's part, I mean, it's not an interpretation, it is part of the RNA structure at the end of the genome. And our interpretation is that the very strong nucleotide level constraint comes from constraint at the RNA level for base pairing of this region and for other overlapping constrained elements uh, within that uh, region. If you look at uh, ORF-N, this is the nucleocapsid ORF. There's two additional uh, proteins that have been proposed. There's ORF9B and ORF14, which we're now calling 9C to avoid confusion because all of that is overlapping the uh, N nucleic acid protein, which is nine. And then you can see here that there's a um, phylo CSF signal in uh, you know, primarily one reading frame, but then in this, ORF, uh, in this alternative reading frame, frame three, you see this signal dropping to zero rather than being strongly negative as it is throughout all of these other proteins, suggesting that in fact 9B is protein coding, but, 9, but 9C or 14 is actually not. And so I'm gonna go now briefly through each of those, uh, recapping some of the uh, insights that I've been sharing. So basically you can see that ORF6, for example, is small, fast and unknown but it makes a very clean functional protein. You see here the amino acid, so the codon level alignment, showing very strong conservation in green of these amino acid properties, uh, you know, despite some pockets of um, change. If you look at ORF8, it is super fast evolving. You see here that it has almost no protein coding conservation, but 
you you know you can see that it's in fact very you know very cleanly uh, protein coding, and in fact that has uh, uh, an additional insertion uh, in some of the species, but not uh, not these species. Um, or orphate also was pseudogenized within the SARS-CoV-1 population, so I think this was a well documented event that happened during the SARS-2003 pandemic, where there was this uh, gain of uh, this region that basically caused uh, that, that ORF to be split into two. ORF10, as I mentioned earlier, is at the end of the genome, it overlaps this RNA structure and it shows you know, no protein coding constraint. In, in, you know, by contrast, it shows these uh, strong um, sort of changes, this internal stop codon, which basically makes it even shorter than the already very short length that it has, suggesting that ORF10 is in fact not a protein coding gene. And uh, some of the evidence that was previously proposed for ORF10 is in fact ribosome footprints. But if you look at these ribosome footprints, they're actually primarily happening, happening outside the actual unique portion of ORF10 and are happening in these downstream ORFs for some reason, suggesting that in fact ORF10 is not uh, protein coding. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's even a frame shifting deletion in one of the five strains that another paper had uh, studied to sort of claim that uh, ORF10 is protein coding, but in fact, they had excluded that sequence, uh, believing that this might be a, you know, sequencing error, um, which was going against the evidence of it being protein coding. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, ORF9, the nucleocapsid protein, has two regions of uh, overlapping ORFs that were previously uh, predicted to be uh, protein coding, ORF9B and ORF9C, also known as ORF14. Uh, ORF9B is very near the start of a nucleocapsid, and it has a start codon context, which is actually stronger than the start codon context of uh, N suggesting that ribosomes that bind the subgenomic RNA for nucleocapsid are, are you know, often going to skip the start of N and instead start translating in 9B using this very strong COSAC uh, sequence. By contrast, OR14 is quite, quite far down this ORF and it has multiple intervening stop codons suggesting that it's unlikely to be translated uh, from the same start. And as you can also see, it, the synonymous constraint elements, which we can define based on nucleotide level constraint in the third codon position, and more generally in the synonymous positions of protein coding regions. Synonymous constraint is very clean in you know, two regions of ORF9B, but not in ORF9C in these nine codon uh, windows, uh, suggesting that in fact, ORF9B is indeed protein coding, but ORF9C is not. And, uh, you know, there's another prediction of ORF3B, which was overlapping uh, 3A and also part of 3 uh, and part of E, uh, that does not appear to be protein coding based on these evolutionary signatures. Uh, there's another ORF B that has been proposed, but that has, uh, you know, multiple premature stop codons. And again, this is very strongly rejected. So then we ask, great, we can reject uh, ORF 14, uh, also known as 9C. We can reject ORF 10. We can accept 9B. We can accept all of these other ORFs. Are there any new genes? So we basically scored every single uh, amino acid interval that was at least 25 codons. And we basically evaluated each of those to see if any of them have signal of uh, protein coding constraint. And uh, the one that we found that was very, very strong is ORF3C, which I'm going to talk about now. So ORF3C, we believe, is a novel, conserved protein coding ORF, and it hides within the protein coding sequence of 3A. So this is the coordinates of that ORF. And you can see here the alignment of ORF-C uh, and also how it looks relative to the alignment of um, uh, ORF-3A. And in fact, you can see that ORF-3C drives the uh, constraint of ORF-3A 
to near zero at the overlapping region. And you can see these synonymous constraint elements are uh, you know, perfectly overlapping the boundaries of ORF3C. And it has a start codon that is, you know, uh, in theory, translatable through leaky uh, scanning from the same start, uh, the, from the same subgenomic RNA as 3A. And this uh, ORF, in fact, has been proposed by two uh, different authors, Cagliani and uh, Finkel, using ribosome footprinting and using synonymous constraint. But again, the evidence, uh, in our view, was quite inconclusive. But the evidence using this phyllocf safe signal is um, uh, just overwhelmingly strong. So to summarize, we basically have uh, revised the protein coding uh, you know, gene catalog of uh, SARS-CoV-2 with uh, rejection of this ORF-A and ORF-8A uh, and 8B, but instead strong acceptance of 8, rejection of 14, but acceptance of 9B, rejection of 10, rejection of 3B, but in fact, discovery of a new uh, protein coding uh, gene uh, 3C. So now we can turn to annotate the mutations that are happening within the uh, current pandemic. So the question is, you know, what are these uh, mutations actually doing? And the first thing that we can do is basically ask, what is the level of constraint or the, the, the speed of evolution uh, from, you know, left to right of uh, all of the ORFs across the Sarbacovirus genomes, so basically across the sort of 60 million years equivalent of mammalian evolution, versus the uh, speed of change within the current pandemic. So we can ask specifically, what is the fraction of amino acids that are changed, that are not perfectly conserved in Sarbacovirus? And what is the fraction of codons with amino acid changing single nucleotide variants in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, you know, uh, gene uh, uh, strain within the strain of SARS-CoV-2. And what we're finding is this very interesting linear relationship between the two, namely protein coding genes that are very uh, slow evolving across the vast uh, swaths of evolution are also very slow evolving currently. And then uh, genes that are very fast evolving across large evolutionary timescales are also fast evolving now except for a handful of exceptions. So you see that S1 is actually significantly below what you would expect it to be based on the number of amino acid changes that uh, amino acid changing uh, single nucleotide variant that you see in the current pandemic. And so is NSP3. So both of them appear to be rapidly evolving before, but kind of slowly evolving now. And I want to point out the difference here between S1 and S2. S2 is super, super slow evolving across uh, different species, but S1 is super fast evolving across, you know, the different strains, across the closely related strains, uh, sorry, the distantly related strains, I should say. But uh, they have the same number of, or the same fraction of uh, SNV, suggesting that, you know, there's something unusual going on there. And by contrast, the nucleocapsid protein is actually um, much, much faster evolving in the current uh, pandemic than it was uh, traditionally. So there's many explanations for this. One is that we got the um, you know, x-axis wrong, that maybe we have overestimated the amount of inter-strain evolution in S1 possibly because of all of the recombination events that might be bringing in additional evolutionary branch length that is not captured by the current uh, strains. Uh, but that's not nearly enough to account for this dramatic difference between S1 and S2. Another possibility is that we have, you know, underestimated the y-axis that basically, um, you know, we, our, our measures are just simply off. Another possibility is that there's just different selective pressures uh, in the set of codons that are evolving in S1 versus the set of codons that are evolving in S2. And another option is that S1 and NSP3 might be part of a wave of 
early adaptation to a new host, followed by slower, a slower mutation after that new host has now been conquered, if you wish, at which point the remaining orbs are now evolving, you know, more rapidly. So there, you know, there's many uh, hypotheses like this pre-adaptation of S1 and SNSP3 versus the other um, uh, proteins. And, and that we can test by going back to the 2003 pandemic and ask if in fact S1 and NSP3 are also rapidly evolving in the early stages of that pandemic. And that's something that we'd be delighted to, to collaborate well, with you guys if you're interested in that. Um, and then, uh, so basically let's look at now uh, S1, which is very rapidly evolving uh, in um, uh, across species, but slowly evolving in the current pandemic. And there's actually something funny going on in S1, which actually goes exactly in the opposite direction of this observation. Namely, the D614G mutation that um, you know, you've, you've heard about, which basically rows in frequency in multiple independent cities, which actually increases viral load in uh, in vitro experiments. Um, what we're finding is that this D614G mutation is not happening in the rapidly evolving portion of S1. It in fact happens in a very slowly evolving uh, portion of S1. And in fact, it conserves a nucleotide position that it, sorry, it disrupts a nucleotide position that has never been previously changed in the 60 million years of bat host evolution. So that suggests that this region is extremely important for transfer between bats, but somehow for transfer between humans, this appears to be a beneficial change. So what we believe is happening is that this is actually a novel human host specific adaptation, which does not correspond to something that you would want to have if you're transferring between bats, but if you're transferring between humans, it's you know, a very nice change to have. So that's basically not only in, you know, in this nucleotide, but also in the context, the context itself is extremely so evolving. And you can see surrounding it, you see all of these, you know, uh, uh, sort of red changes which are disruptive to the amino acid. So that was for S1, which basically not only happens to be slow evolving, but the one mutation that everybody has heard of is actually in a fast evolving, uh, sorry, in a slow evolving region, which is fast evolving the current pandemic. So, you know, two exceptions here. The other one that's of note is N. So N has many more single nucleotide variants than expected, suggesting that in fact, it might be under positive selection, that in fact, there's you know, pressure for rapid change in N. And indeed, N shows all of these little red dots scattered throughout that are basically disrupting conserved amino acids. So these are single nucleotide variants that are con disrupting conserved amino acids. And you see this huge increase in red compared to what you would expect. Across the entire genome, you find that you know, synonymous changes are happening in, uh, th that these changes are happening primarily in non-conserved amino acids, whereas in N they're happening primarily in conserved amino acids, suggesting rapid, rapid uh, change in function. And there's one region in particular of N, which is genome-wide significant, that is enriched for uh, these uh, conserved amino acid changes. So you can see here that nearly every nucleotide in this 20, sorry, nearly every codon in this 20 amino acid region was in fact very deeply conserved across herbivoruses, but is now specifically changing way, way more than what you would expect by chance. And that 20 amino acid region, in fact, overlaps this predicted B cell epitope, suggesting that it might actually be associated with immune system avoidance. Uh, that, that sort of pushing uh, N to change rapidly to avoid being detected by the human uh, immune system. So that has, of course, implications for, you know, vaccine design, implications for sort of how to interpret these mutations and uh, so on and so forth. But outside these exceptions, we find this remarkable conservation, the uh, uh, agreement between sarbacovirus conservation versus SARS-CoV-2 uh, variation. So basically you see that there's lower density of single nucleotide variants in conserved amino acids, 
and there's higher uh, missense uh, single nucleotide variants at the three prime end of the genome. There's lower synonymous single nucleotide variants within synonymous constrained regions. So if an amino acid is constrained, it's less likely to be changing uh, in the current pandemic. And e even if a synonymous region is constrained, it's less likely to be changing in the current pandemic. So we've basically made all of this available and uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, very happy that a lot of people seem to be using both these annotations and uh, these alignments uh, that we have constructed. So the, these are the folks leading the work. So Erwin Youngreis with help from uh, Rachel. And then we've also had a very lovely discussions from, you know, with uh, several folks. And we've also been using the uh, SNVs that are made available by Next Train and GICID. So what I'm gonna do is actually stop here and see if there's any questions. And then if there's time, we'll switch to the uh, other presentation. Uh, so, uh, Teresa. Hi, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Pooja Jain. Actually, sorry, I missed, I think, a few of your slides in the beginning. And when I saw um, your presentation, immediately one thing came and you touched upon it. What makes this virus, you know, extra contagious? And um, do, do we think uh, the future viruses, when they evolve or in the beginning, they were like this and later they have become, you know, more recessive? Uh, or similarly, the future viruses, if they would come, uh, do we predict any more contagious options or how, how, this, uh, how this scenario is going to change? So like that's a very basic fundamental question I have since beginning of, you know, this pandemic. So uh, I think the main thing that this um, uh, pandemic teaches us and uh, even what our work teaches us is humility. Namely, uh, we would have just never expected uh, this little guy here to be uh, you know, the source of the pandemic that has <laughs> shut down the world. So if you look at two th the SARS 2003 pandemic, it was in this, in, in this tree here. This is a whole other tree from a whole other branch. So there's really nothing that we could have done with full knowledge of the SARS 2003 pandemic to predict anything about the 2019 pandemic that has basically shut down all of 2020. So the main thing I'm, <laughs> I want to say in, in response to your, to your question is that we have no idea that basically, um, we have no idea why this virus is uh, sort of asymptomatic for the first 10 days of transmission why, but, but I mean, the properties that make it so deadly and so devastating is, is what everybody's talking about. Basically, you know, transmission without debilitating the host early on, followed by massive, uh, you know, attack on the host. So it's those two properties. Many viruses are either, you know, too deadly to spread well or too benign to worry about. This one has both with the time lag. And that's what makes it so deadly. What the genome tells us about that, I'm afraid to say nothing. I mean, you know, there's no, no insights that we can gain either from the phylogenetic placement of it or the uh, comparative genomics of it. I mean, there's, you know, you know, plenty of information about the S1 adaptation, how well it binds, et cetera. But, you know, we don't really understand this time lag here. I mean, uh, maybe you guys do, but I certainly don't. Uh, Will, Will Dampierre, and you have a question, right? Can you go ahead? Yeah, um, you talked about uh, changes in, in the N protein, the, the, the change seemingly con conserved yeah. amino acids. Yeah. Have you used any like gene function prediction tools or any sort of you know, prediction analysis to see whether those functions actually, whether those amino acids are changing function or if they're, uh, so, so what do predictions tools do? They basically, they will, they will basically say, okay, great. I have the structure of a protein and within the structure of that protein, switching this amino acid will change, uh, you know, that, that structure. That's sort of, if they're super sophisticated and if they have specifically the three-dimensional structure of nucleocapsid and how it wraps around the RNA. But most of the time, what these tools are telling you is if, a particular amino acid is easily replaceable with another amino acid using some approximation. In my view, the approximation that you get from those protein structure prediction tools is actually much poorer than the approximation that you get by looking at comparative genomics. 
because what comparative genomics is tells you is here are the amino acids that are important in the context of this particular coronavirus lineage. And right, but they in might. Context, we know that these amino acids are hugely important for the function. So that's sort of what, what we're using here as evidence. Now, what they actually do, um, you know, my guess is something to do with, uh, you know, the B cell lepto, but I, I don't know if that answers your question and whether. Erwin well, uh, I guess it answers my question in that that's not your question. Uh, my, I was just wondering if you had looked to see whether those amino acids happen to be known binding motifs of these epitopes or any of those other sort of things. But it seems that you're more looking at just the, the phylogenetic conservations. Yeah, so, so Erwin, I'm wondering if you could um, sort of, if you have any additional insights on that? Uh, I mean, we can try some of the structure prediction programs, but we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Okay, I think Akil, Akil, who is also faculty in our department, Akil Badia. Um, yeah, yeah hi. Uh, hi, a uh, really fantastic talk. All kinds of ideas come to my mind. So the thing that I'll actually contact you about something that I want to do in malaria parasite and mitochondrial DNA, but uh, that's besides the point with something really interesting we could potentially do. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you offline on that. But my question was, uh, have you uh, sort of tried to plug in non-canonical initiation codons and whether or not that will change in some ways, because I think there have been some instances, at least in this short orbs, that there have been non-canonical initiation that can happen as well. And I don't know whether you've got, uh, because especially for the ribosome uh, footprinting, whether or not uh, there is any indication of uh, that potentially uh, be part of the, the SARS. And, and, and uh, related to that, is there any, uh, biochemical evidence for this protein being actually made and, and how much is being made, uh, these orb, uh, new orbs that you found? But, oh, uh, so yeah, er Erwin, I think you would be the best person to answer both questions. These are fantastic questions, Akil, and we, we've, we've thought about a lot uh, of that, yeah. and I think uh, Erwin, you know. Um, we, we searched the entire genome for novel uh, protein coding conserved novel ORFs, and we included uh, non canonical start codons, uh, near cognate codons, mm -hmm. and we did not find any others that, that were convincing. Uh, remind me, what was the second question? About I think we should, the biochemical evidence for. Or other for oh, so, so for R3C, that was one of the ones that was predicted by ribosome profiling. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think people have looked for mass spec evidence, but not found it, which is, which is not surprising because it's such a short work. Right, but could it be that if you just have, have this protein as, you know, just make a synthetic peptide, because these are so fairly short, and whether or not they have any uh, physiological effects at all? Uh, right, we have not, we have not done mm -hmm. that. Where our analysis so far has been entirely computational, yeah. uh, though using other experimental data sets that are out there. I mean, it's, this is great mind. This is fantastic. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'm very Thank happy you. to hear. Uh, I, I will, I'll be in touch with you soon. Great. So. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I think, Manoli, you're going to start with your second part now. <laughs> that sounds great. So, uh, Sonia, can, uh, hold on one yeah? second, guys. There's two student questions. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. So, Teresa, you want to ask yours? Hi, Teresa. Yes. Yeah. We cannot hear you. And, um, Teresa, we cannot hear you. Teresa, I'm going to go ahead and read your question since you're having an audio issue. Yeah. So her question um, was um, really like the talk, um, like the idea uh, with the unnamed ORFs maybe evolving faster to adapt to a new host. Um, would you expect that these uh, SARS-2 ORF proteins have functions to interact with innate immune mediators similar to recent studies in SARS-1 um, with an example of referencing ORF-8B activating the inflammasome? I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised basically, but uh, you know, we, haven't, we haven't looked at that specifically. So I'm happy to you know, look at evidence that you might have that is complementary to what we have, but that, you know, that, that's my interpretation for some of those adaptations that basically 
they're evading the immune system or they're uh, adapting to new hosts. But, but it's also important to know that, you know, much of evolution is also just neutral. If it doesn't hurt, you know, it's still fine. So I do want to caution that, you know, not every change is adaptive. My guess is that the ORF N changes that we're seeing are very clearly adaptive because they're happening specifically in a way that disrupts amino acids as opposed to sort of happening randomly and being randomly distributed. Um, for some of those, um, you know, unnamed ORFs, it's, it's unclear whether they are clearly selective or, or not, but, but if you have additional evidence, we'll, happy to, we'll be happy to integrate it. Um, if I can add something to that and also the earlier question uh, uh, with regard to what's different about this pandemic. Uh, in, you know, I think of some of our work as we're, we're map makers. We're, we're making a map of the genome that can be used by other researchers you know, throughout the world for all of these investigations. So, you know, we're at least letting them know this one's a real gene, that one's probably not, don't waste your time with it. Great, and there was one more student question. Yeah. Ab Abhishek, can you do yours? Uh, hi, yes, my question was, I, I uh, you said that uh, the S1 mutations, DGA mutations were fine, uh, were, correspond were correlated with higher viral loads. Uh, do the, uh, nucleocapsid uh, SNVs also relate with the higher viral load, it's just that it leads to immune, immune evasion rather than higher viral loads? Yeah, it's a great question. We, I don't think we have the data for this, and I don't think we have such evidence. Basically, the, the viral load experiments were specifically done for, you know, a set of mutations that were found within uh, patients, including the D614 G mutation, but I don't think anyone has tested these nucleocapsid proteins. But again, that's where <laughs> you guys come in. <laughs> Basically, we are the genomicists. Uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that, um, you know, if you're, if you're interested, we can help guide the design of those experiments. But I think this, this is definitely something worth testing. All right, thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to the other presentation. So um, the, um, the main part of our, uh, of our lab so basically, Erwin has, what, maybe 10 projects, one of which is this one. Um, and our lab has, you know, maybe 40 people, one of whom is Erwin. So basically, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 work represents a tiny fraction of what we do, uh, even though it's of enormous interest to me and to many others. Um, but the main, the main thrust of our work is really enabling the understanding of the genetic basis of human disease. And the reason why I wanna sort of tell, tell you about this very briefly is because in all of these traits, we're finding that immune cells and immune processes are playing an enormously important role. So if you guys are interested in sort of immune uh, processes related to brain, related to metabolism, related to immune disorders, or related to cancer, this is something that we are thrilled and super excited to collaborate with you on. But just to give you a sense of sort of where our lab comes from, we're basically uh, looking to understand the human genome, 1.5% of which is protein coding, and that's what Erwin is focusing on, and the other 99% of which is non-coding, and that's what the, the rest of the team is focusing on. And the reason why we're focusing on the non-coding genome is because when you look at genome-wide association studies with any trait, including susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2, uh, um, you're, you're basically seeing that the vast majority of these genetic associations lie in non-coding regions. So if we're trying to understand the mechanism of say FTO, which is the strongest genetic association with obesity, 89 common variants underlying this region are all non-coding. None of them actually perturb the protein of FTO. So when we started, you know, we as the field of genetics started with genome-wide association studies and said, oh, that's great. We're going to find new disease mechanisms, new target genes, new therapeutics, enable precision medicine, personalized medicine. And then what we, were, what we stumbled upon was that in 93% of cases, we had no idea what was going on. By not knowing that an amino acid is disrupted, you don't really know the target gene. What we showed in my own work, in, in, our, in our lab's work, in the case of FTO, 
is that the true target genes are in fact 1.2 million nucleotides away, IRX3 and RX5. You know, so not knowing that it's protein coding means that you don't know the target gene, you don't know the causal variant, you don't know the cell type of action, you don't know the relevant pathways, and you don't know the mechanism. So that's a huge problem. And basically what our lab does is that we start with genetics across both common and rare variants, and then we profile the intermediate molecular phenotypes resulting from these changes. So we profile RNA and the epigenome systematically in both healthy and disease samples to infer driver genes, regions, and cell types, and to uh, validate the predictions in human cells and in mouse models, and of course, disseminate the results at the service of the scientific community. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about sort of how we do that. So the goal is to figure out the circuitry, to figure out what cell type these non-coding variants are acting in based on the epigenomic annotations that they overlap based on whether they're in enhancers that are active in liver or in heart and so on and so forth. The target genes based on the wiring of these regions and the upstream regulators based on the motifs that they contain so that we have the full circuitry. And in the case of FTO that I showed you earlier, what we published in uh, 2015 was that the genetic variant that uh, underlies this region is in fact disrupting a motif for this AT-rich interacting domain protein that normally binds this motif and represses the super enhancer that's about 12 kV long. And that super enhancer, when repressed, shuts down IRX3 and IRX5, which are themselves master regulators of a process known as thermogenesis. This is the um, depolarization of the mitochondrial membrane that basically causes your excess calories in your diet to be burned as heat rather than to be stored as fat. And what we showed in this paper is that if you go in by knowing the circuitry and intervene by changing the upstream regulator or the downstream target gene, or even by genome editing the nucleotide variant, you can switch back and forth like a switch between lean and obese phenotypes and completely restore the cellular function of thermogenesis by a single nucleotide alteration in primary adipocytes from human uh, risk carriers, risk allele carriers. And in mice, if you knock down IRX3 in uh, adipose specific construct, you basically see that the mice are unable to gain weight. They start out leaner, but when you put them on a high fat diet, normal mice gain weight, these mice don't gain weight. That's, that's the premise of our work. We're basically inferring these circuits so we can manipulate them. And what we do is that we, carry out epigenomic profiling across hundreds of tissues, including many immune uh, processes, and then inferring where are these regions acting based on the overlap between enhancers active in different uh, tissues and genetic variants associated with different traits, giving us this uh, you know, remarkable diagonal. Uh, one big surprise was that genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's disease were in fact not enriched in whole brain samples. They were only enriched in monocytes. And these are uh, you know, markers of both the um, circulating macrophages as well as the resident immune cells of the brain. So again, microglia came up as this sort of master uh, process that underlies Alzheimer's disease. So basically this immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. And this is not the only time. In schizophrenia, we found the same thing, that in fact, not inflammatory microglia, but instead these synaptic microglia, these immune cells that are regulating synaptic pruning is where the genetic signal is actually localizing and where the expression changes are happening. So these immune cells are underlying many of these disorders. So um, what we're finding is in the context of Alzheimer's, I mentioned this already, in the context of um, metabolism, I wanna jump very briefly to uh, our work on metabolism here. What we're basically doing is profiling the uh, changes that are happening at the single cell level across multiple tissues in human and in mouse that are associated with sedentary and training, as well as high fat diet and lean diet. 
And in both cases, what we're finding is that these immune cells are in fact mediating many of these changes. Basically, if you look at what are these differentially expressed genes between lean and obese, between exercise and sedentary, you're finding T cell activation and you know, sort of immune processes are in fact many of these mediators. And these immune cells are in fact involved in tissue tissue communication within the resident uh, sort of immune cells of the fat, of the muscle, uh, and um, you know, the specific immune regulators that are underlying uh, these changes. And um, so again, I'm, I'm just trying to highlight some of the immune processes. Uh, if you look at PTSD, once more, you find that when we predict what are the cell types that underlie these changes, we're finding again, whole blood is much stronger than any of the brain signals for PTSD as well. And then in the context of cancer, we're basically looking at the changes that are happening in immune cells in the context of immunotherapy and sort of how that's basically, you know, teaching us about the tumor immune interface and how that's changing with specific uh, subsets of cells that are altered during the course of immunotherapy and that are also predictive of immunotherapy response. So I have a much longer presentation, obviously, and there's many, many uh, sort of aspects of the lab that I would love to highlight. But I think the message that, that I want to convey is that uh, immune cells are massively important and are found pervasively in uh, brain disorders, in metabolic disorders, in immune disorders, of course, and in cancer. So with this, I'll, I'll uh, stop and basically uh, say that I, I would be Thrilled to collaborate if any of you guys are interested in sort of the role of immune cells in uh, you know, all of these uh, common diseases. And uh, oh, the, the last thing is in the meeting that I was at until 11 a.m., one of the points that we were talking about is that immune processes that are changed in brain are not just in immune cells of the brain. If you look at neurons, the neurons themselves are turning on immune response genes so with single cell profiling, we can tell that it's not the immune cells. With bulk, previously, we were always attributing changes that we we're finding in immune genes to just be driven by immune cells. But now that we're doing single cell profiling across all of these brains, we're seeing immune changes in non-immune cells. So I really invite you all to sort of embrace a much broader view of the uh, immune functions um, of the, you know, of, of the human body to not just be constrained to what we traditionally think of as immune cells activating these immune processes. Anyway, I'll stop there. I, you know, I have uh, tens of hours of talks that are recorded on the web. If you guys want to hear more about all this, uh, there's, you know, plenty that I'll, I'll paste the YouTube playlist where I've collected several of my talks that are online. So you guys can sort of see the whole version of this, but uh, you know, I really wanted to focus specifically on the immune uh, component there. Thank you, Manolis, fantastic talk. Um, do the students have any other question for Manolis or maybe you can guys ask um, during uh, your time with, with him during the lunch? I mean, lunch, virtual lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, we don't have pizza, right? Uh, yeah, um, I, there was a delivery with pizza. How did you know my address? Oh, wow, that's, that's Brian, our chair. Um, okay, so faculty, do you guys have any questions for Manolis before he gets into the student meeting? I, I don't see any, any in the chat. I pasted into the chat window for everyone. I pasted a link to that playlist. So, you know, if you guys wanna hear the one hour version of my two minute presentation, uh, you know. There's plenty of versions out there. A, a quick also, question, if I may, uh, just uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, your immune cell. Uh, so clearly this is going to be affected by microbiome as well, right? So, so how, how are you putting that into your, this massive uh, single cell uh, profiling that, that you're doing and whether or not that would be, uh, that could be done or not? I, I always apologize at my talks for covering too much. This time I'm apologizing for covering too little. 
So yeah, unfortunately, we did not work on the microbiome. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, absolutely, I think the microbiome, uh, there's, uh, I mean, even with Alzheimer's, the history of infections of a person is a, is a huge biomarker for mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease. If you look at the circulating blood, you see that macrophages are in fact indicative of epigenomic changes that are predictive of Alzheimer's disease without looking at the brain of those individuals. Uh, the microbiome is greatly influencing both the brain directly through the gut-brain axis, but also the immune system through you know, all of these interactions. So it's something that you know, we don't have systematic data for, we don't have links between genetic variation and um, the you know, microbiome composition and organisms. And again, you know, most of the microbiome analysis nowadays are basically mostly looking at what species are going up or down. Mm -hmm. I think we need so much more detailed information. Yeah. We're now gathering metabolites in the context exactly. of obesity and exercise. So basically we're, we're sort of seeing how are the metabolites changing in coordination with the cell type composition, in, in coordination with, uh, you know, specific gene expression changes. But unfortunately, we don't have the microbiome as a variable there. So no, but I, I think I, I was mostly thinking about the microbial metabolites that may be affecting this. So it's not necessarily the composition of the microbiome, but the metabolites that they're making yeah. and that are in circulating, which could be, yeah. So that's something that we are measuring, and we are measuring sort of, you know, metabolites in many of the tissues uh, around the body. And, and sort of very often we see correlations between the gene expression changes and the metabolite abundance. Um, so, you know, th there's definitely a huge signal there, but the microbiome would be another component that would be super interesting. Thank you. All right. So Manol is uh, keeping this Zoom. Um, so... Um, Students, your time is star now. Sonia, Sonia, one thing that yes. I always do is I always like to take a group picture. And I know that I'm not there in person, but can I ask everyone to just turn on your camera, give me a big smile, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> let us please do a virtual group photo, even though I'm not there. Sure. And then uh, hopefully we will uh, meet again in person. So uh, this is awesome. I see so many people turning on their videos. This is great. Hi, everyone. Wow, a lot of humans are behind the black screens. Hi, everyone. So next time you're in Boston and, we, you know, hopefully when we have a country again, come visit. It'd be fun to kind of meet everyone. So, um, Thank okay. you. I'm now going to take a screenshot. So look at your camera and smile. Ready? There you go. <laughs> so we Thank have a group photo. Thanks, so, everyone. I see you in uh, 45 minutes, Manolis. Sounds like a plan. Thank you, Sonia. Erwin, you're welcome to stay. I think I would love you to meet the students who are interested in, uh, you know, COVID-19 and all of that. All right. Thank you. Thanks, James.